Don't forget to subscribe, follow, like and share. Also press on the bells for new recaps. Let's enjoy. The show opens on a Peruvian beach, where a fisherman is preparing to go out into the sea in order to catch his trade. Upon sailing at a distance, he throws down the net, but for some reason, it is pulled down, causing him to be dragged into the water. Soon after, the net settles down at the seafloor and gets stuck in the pointy crevasses of rocks. As a result, he dives into the water to untangle it, but before he can do so, he is attacked by a swarm of fish that kills him instantly. The scene then cuts to the Shetland Island in Scotland, where we are introduced to a marine biologist named Charlie Wagner. She works for the Institute of Marine Biology, whose headquarters is located in Kiel, Germany. However, she is currently stationed in this island due to some mistakes she made with the AUVs in the past. The AUVs are autonomous underwater vehicles that are used for surveillance purposes and the identification of new forms of marine life. One day, Charlie receives a call from Rahim, her co-worker in Kiel. He instructs her to accurately map a seabed section by running the AUV 25 meters above the sea floor. He reveals that their program head, Professor Lehman, is displeased with Charlie's past mistakes, so she now wants her to carry out the work correctly. Their conversation is abruptly interrupted when Charlie notices a signal on her computer screen, alerting that one of the AUVs has stopped working. As a result, she hangs up the call and goes out to the sea to inspect. Upon diving into the water, she finds something stuck in the chains of a buoy. As she proceeds to untangle it, she senses something around her, which scares her. She then quickly floats back to the surface, only to discover that her boat is drifting away from her. But fortunately, Charlie manages to swim towards it and get a hold, allowing her to breathe a sigh of relief. Did she get the AUV though? Did she do her damn job this time? We then cut to Canada, where the Vancouver Marine Institute discovers a washed up orca at the beach. It has several bruises on its body that indicates human intervention. To delve into the incident, two institute members named Leon and Jack visit a local fisherman named Kit at Murray Cove. The fisherman reveals that the orca uncharacteristically attacked their boat earlier that morning. They tried to avoid it, but when it kept on attacking, they had no other choice but to fight back. That's a bunch of crap, Kit. Orcas are sweethearts. Meanwhile, Jess and Thomas from the Institute of Marine Biology travel to Shetland to help Charlie in repairing the damaged AUV. Thomas is surprised to discover a damaged circuit board, which raises his suspicion towards Charlie, but she swears that she didn't do anything. That evening, Charlie visits a local bar seeking relaxation. There, she's approached by a fisherman named Douglas McKinnon, the most fisherman name of them all, who strikes up a conversation with her. Not knowing of his profession, Charlie regards this place as overfished, but despite this initial offense, the two get along and they end up spending the night together. Back in Canada, Leon is concerned by the delay in the migrating whales because they have never been this late to arrive. This rare phenomenon has started to affect the local marine tourism in Canada. Leon's girlfriend, Lizzie, runs a small boat that takes spectators to see these whales in open waters. However, she isn't getting enough customers due to the lack of, well, whales. When they meet, Lizzie confides in Leon that she might even be forced to sell the boat if this situation situation persists. The following day, Charlie prepares to deploy the AUV in the water, and she's accompanied by Douglas. As they sail in the water, they spot numerous pieces of methane hydrate on the surface. This appears to be unusual, so Charlie records the site in her phone. Later in the evening, she stays on a conference call with Raheem, Jess, and Professor Lehman. After a brief discussion of the methane hydrates, the professor reprimands Charlie for taking unauthorized non-employee personnel on the boat, emphasizing the Institute's potential liability in case of an accident. I don't care if you like to touch the fisherman's penis, yeah, you keep him off the boat. In the next scene, we are introduced to Alicia Delaware, an Italian-American reporter who works for the World Oceanic Congress. She is currently in Canada to cover the news of the migrating whales. During her meeting with Jack, they exchange information about each other. Jack reveals he was in charge of training dolphins in the Navy to clear underwater mines in the Persian Gulf. As the dolphins retired, the Navy put them in the 
apartments and waited for them to die. Jack couldn't let that happen, so he generously released them in open waters. However, this resulted in his expulsion from the Navy. The next day, Leon detects underwater signals, indicating the whale's arrival. However, he's taken aback, as they all are appearing at the same time. As soon as Lizzie gets this news, she takes a boat full of people out to the ocean. Sensing something amiss, Leon sets out to the sea for a closer inspection. While on the water, a whale surfaces for moments, locks eyes with him, and swims away. Leon then uses his binoculars and discovers that it's actually going towards Lizzie's boat. Moreover, he hears the sound of multiple orcas advancing toward the boat at a great speed. In a panicked state, he attempts to contact Lizzie's boat, but gets no response. Hence, he races to save his girlfriend. Initially, a whale performs a few flips, exciting the spectators. But soon after, it lands directly onto the boat, splitting it in half and plunging the occupants into the water. I just went whale watching last week. I'm so glad I didn't read this first. Following this, the apex predators begin preying on the passengers one after another. Leon arrives at the same time and starts pulling the people aboard. But as he extends his hand to save Lizzie at last, one of the orcas drags her down, leaving him devastated. We got your girlfriend. <laughs> The scene then shifts to France, where we see a restaurant chef buying some fresh seafood from the market. It's probably Lizzie. After shopping, he heads back to the restaurant and starts preparing lobsters for that night. During the process, one of the lobsters squirts white liquid onto his face. I know you're expecting me to make a joke here, but I won't. This disgusts the chef, who then orders his subordinate, Gilbert, to clean up the mess. After some time, the chef starts feeling unwell and steps outside for fresh air. His condition deteriorates as he ultimately collapses to the ground and vomits blood before dying. Gilberto, who is also exposed to the poisonous lobster, starts feeling uneasy and is admitted to the hospital. There, two French doctors, Sophia and Cecile, attend to Gilberto and are surprised by the rapid onset of symptoms. Cecile walks back to her cabin and is shocked to find her children there. Turns out that the kids took the train by themselves from Brussels and didn't inform either parent before coming to France. Cecile then immediately calls her husband because it's his turn to babysit. However, she learns that he's unavailable right now. On the other hand, a charter ship, which is hired by an organization called Hofstad Energy, sails in the Norwegian Sea. A professor named Sigur from Trondheim University is summoned to address a peculiar species of ice worm they found in the seafloor. Sigur is instantly alarmed and intrigued by the rapid pace of its replication. Upon further examination, he discovers that these worms have unusually long and sharp claws at the top of their heads. He asks Tina, who is the compliance officer for Hofstad, to refer to the experts, but she expresses her wish to continue with Sigur. It appears that the two have some romantic past, but neither wants to acknowledge the tension between them. Sigur is also apprehensive to help and see his name as one of the experts consulted because he knows about Hofstad's shady history of bending the rules around environmental clearances. Later on, Sigur and Tina visit Professor Lehman's lab to discuss the same species. Like the other sea creatures, the worms exhibit a suicidal tendency, continuously penetrating the ice on the seafloor, even though there isn't anything for them to feed on. Afterwards, the two have a meeting with Hofstad members Aaron and Erica, who are worried that the new discovery might hinder their operations of retrieving gas and oil reserves. Both Sigur and Tina advocate for environmentally responsible practices, volunteering to collect more samples and assess the extent of the worm's spread. After meeting, Sigur offers Tina a ride, but he's kinda sad to see her new boyfriend waiting outside. Oh, he is the real sea worm. Meanwhile, in France, Cecile continues to investigate the poison case. Through questioning a restaurant employee, she discovers that Elena, another staff member, was the one to dispose of the toxic lobster into the garbage. Following this, Cecile visits Elena's residence, only to learn that she has already passed away simultaneously. At the hospital, Gilberto suffers a massive heart attack and dies. On a different front, Leon visits the Port Authority's office to talk to Captain.
Captain Nakamura. The captain shares details of another whale attack incident involving a ship called Barrier Queen. Leon wonders why these whales are showing aggressive behavior, as they typically only attack to protect their babies. Elsewhere, Sigur, Tina, and other Hovestad members carry out a second exploration of the sea. As they deploy their device into the water, it is unexpectedly pulled into the sea floor, almost drowning the entire ship. Afterwards, Sigur and Tina pay a visit to Lehman, who shows them how the bacteria mat is also eating its way through the ice. According to her, these bacteria can go to the bottom of the seabed, which would be disastrous for marine life. Later that day, Tina invites Sigur to come with her to an energy council meeting. She wants to ascertain if the worms have been found by others or not. Sigur is initially reluctant due to his tight schedule, but she manages to convince him to make a short trip. In the next scene, Jess and Thomas are working on their ship, Juno, in the open sea. Suddenly, their ship starts shaking, and the radar signals alarmingly. The workers try to save themselves, but to no avail, as the entire ship is sunk. This news soon reaches Rahim's ears, who then relays it to Charlie leaving her in shock. Back in France, Cecile examines blood work from the chef, Gilberto, and Elena, leading to a startling revelation. The infections are caused by Vibrio vulnificus, a bacterium that produces toxins upon contact with blood. Furthermore, the Vibrio consumes human blood at an astonishing rate. Sophia, who has been listening to Cecile, informs her that more people have been reported with the infection up the coast. Cecile finally realizes the infection is spreading due to the disposed lobster that has contaminated the water system. Concerned for her children's safety amidst rising infection cases, she decides to send them to her father at their vacation house in Corbigny. Place sounds goofy as shit. On the other hand, Leon, who wants to get to the bottom of the attacks by the whales, gains permission to carry out a post-mortem on the dead orca. Upon doing so, he finds a strange, fungus-like clot growing in the dead orca's brain tissue. After some time, he also recognizes that all the attacks and abnormalities until now have been in the migration path of the whales. Upon learning of all this, he decides to take matters in his own hands and get to the bottom of this conundrum. Following this, Leon, along with Jack and Alicia, sails to the middle of the ocean where they've tracked the sleeping whales. Leon dives down and places a camera on one of their backs. As soon as he does so, the whales abruptly awaken and start behaving aggressively. But fortunately, Leon manages to resurface just in time, and the trio narrowly escapes. Meanwhile, Sigur has a meeting with Sato, an operator from Mifune Enterprises, to exchange his findings on ice worms with something in return. As they talk, Sigur suggests that the ongoing situation can pose a problem for Mifune Enterprises, given their interests in the shipping business. In response, Sato asks him for some time to think and discuss this matter with his superior before closing the deal. After this brief meeting, Sigur goes to meet Tina and confides in her about the meeting. Hearing this, she believes that Mifune will leverage their finding to prop up his efforts in cleaning the ocean through his other scientific endeavors. While talking, Sigur begins to get overwhelmed by past memories and struggles to focus on work-related matters. As a result, he starts flirting with Tina, despite knowing that she has a new boyfriend. Initially, she tries to resist, but ends up giving in to her feelings and Sigur's raw Norwegian charm and cheats on her partner. The following day, Sigur receives a call from Sato, who shares their findings from the South China Sea and the Nankai Trough. Importantly, Sato reveals that Hovestad doesn't have an exploration license and suggests that Tina may have misled Sigur. He also forwards a video that proves Hovestad's ill intentions from the past. Despite this revelation, Sigur doesn't confront Tina directly, probably because he likes her bum a lot. Instead, he stresses the urgency of going back to the sea and surveying other areas to assess the extent of the ice worm's impact. He claims that the worms, situated on slopes, have the potential to disrupt the marine ecosystem. Elsewhere, Charlie returns to the Institute of Marine Biology to learn what happened to Juno. Not long after, Professor Lehman arrives with video footage depicting the sinking of the Juno. Together with Charlie and Rahim, they start reviewing the footage. Holy crap, it was the avatars. In the meantime, Leon gets to know that the whale has removed his camera 
camera. He later retrieves it from the middle of the ocean. He then takes it to the lab, where Jack and Alicia join him in watching it. As the video plays, we see the whales diving deeper than usual, toward a mysterious illuminated entity in the depths of the ocean, something which is also seen clasping onto the drowned Juno.